Waiting is hard. Waiting is very hard. Seriously, how are you doing at the waiting game this week? How are you doing? This past week, I was at Grassroots getting lunch with a friend, and as, um, as we were eating lunch together, I looked over at a couple, and as soon as I looked over at them, they both froze, got this anxious expression on their faces, reached for their cell phones, whipped them out, and started scrolling down quickly to refresh their screens. And I watched them as we were eating lunch, and they did this about five more times. They would just freeze all, the second, all of a sudden and reach for their cell phones, whip them out, and start scrolling anxiously to refresh the screens on their cell phones. And so I shared this with my friend, what this couple was doing, and, and we both laughed. And then realizing that this couple might know something that we didn't, we both whipped out our phones and immediately started swiping down to refresh to see if any election results had come in. Maybe you did that this week as well. This week has felt like one giant waiting game as we waited and waited and waited for the election returns to come in. In fact, all of 2020 has felt like one giant waiting game. We have been waiting for the fires to be put out, waiting for the lockdown to end, waiting for test results, waiting for a vaccine to come out, waiting for when we can safely regather with family and friends and our church family. Honestly, sometimes I feel like I am just waiting for 2020 to end and the new year to start. That's what it feels like this year. Our readings this morning have a lot to tell us about waiting. They tell us what is worth waiting for and how to wait for it. So this morning, that's what I want to look at with you. What is worth waiting for and how do you wait for it? Our passages all tell us that the return of Jesus is worth waiting for. The return of Jesus is our only hope as Christians. I wonder, are we as eager for this age to end and the new age to begin as we all are for the end of 2020 and the start of 2021? Are you as eager for the return of Jesus as you were for the election returns this week? Do you, are you eager for it? Because that's the first lesson that our readings have for us. First lesson is be eager. Be eager for the return of Jesus. We should be eagerly desiring that Jesus would return. The return of Jesus is good news. Actually, it's the best news. Jesus himself talks about it frequently in the Gospels, and the Apostle Paul always included the return of Jesus as an essential part of the Gospel. So when we talk about what is the Gospel, what is the good news, a critical piece of it is that Jesus is going to return one day and make all things right. And if we don't believe that, if that's not what we consider crucial to the gospel, then we're actually not believing the whole gospel. We're missing a critical piece. In the parable that Jesus tells in our gospel reading, all ten virgins are outside eagerly waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. Now, this, uh, this parable, this story, might seem a little odd to us in our culture in our day because we have different cultural practices than they did in the first century. But I think there is actually a pretty close modern-day equivalent. You know when you're at a wedding and you've, gotten, you've had the wedding at a church, but the reception is in a different location, and the wedding is over and everybody goes to the reception location except the bridal party because they're back at the church taking pictures. So everybody shows up wherever the reception location is, and they can smell the food, they're getting hungry, there's no music yet because the bridal party's not there, so you're bored, and everybody's standing around awkwardly, waiting and waiting and waiting for the bridal party to arrive so that the party can begin. Well, that's basically a way to understand what is happening in our passage this morning. In the first century, the bridesmaids would wait for 
the arrival of the groom and his entourage, and they would go outside lining the road with their lamps, lighting the way for him to come and start the party, leading the bride into the party. And so the bridesmaids are eagerly waiting for the arrival of the groom so that the party can start. Everybody's waiting. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like that moment of anticipation and eagerness when you're waiting for the party to start. This is what it's like to live as a Christian in this world. That's what Jesus says. We are standing around waiting eagerly, anticipating when is the bridegroom going to arrive so the party can start. We are waiting for Jesus, eagerly, always waiting for him to come back and make all things right. When we look at the world around us, we see a world that is clearly not as it should be. One second, we're all pulling together, and the next second, we're all pulling apart. One second, we're pulling together to fight a pandemic. The next second, we're in fist fights over toilet paper, right? Lifelong friends and family members who were longing to be reunited after a long quarantine are now refusing to speak to each other because of politics. And this is just the little stuff. When we zoom out, we see mass suffering, a global pandemic infecting millions and killing hundreds of thousands, violence in our cities and in our homes, child poverty and human trafficking, we see signs that the world is not as it should be all over the place. And this injustice, this unrighteousness, should make us upset. It should make us angry. It should make us want to eagerly cry out for Jesus to come back and make all things right. Now you might say, but wait a second, David. What about our reading from Amos? You remember the reading from Amos, how it started? Doesn't Amos say... Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. That's not a very positive image of the day of the Lord. Well, let me be clear. Let me explain what Amos is saying here, because I think it's very important. For the Christian who is living life with Jesus... The return of Jesus is very good news. But for those who have lived life for themselves and who have not sought God's justice, when his justice comes on the earth, it is very bad news for them. It's very bad news. And so we need to heed this warning. Notice in our passage from Amos, when he's talking about who is coming under judgment, it's the religious people. God says in verse 21, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, the melody of your harps. I will not listen. And then God says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What is God saying here? God is saying that he is not interested in our religious practices if we are not also pursuing justice and righteousness outside these walls, out there in the world. And righteousness here just means making the world right. That's what righteousness is. It's when, it's when you do actions that make things right that were wrong. That's what justice is, too. Justice is about taking things that are wrong and making them right. That's what we're longing for. Now, we know that everything's not going to be made right and that justice is not going to fully come until Jesus returns. But we can still light our lamps and stand out in the darkness. We're called to be lights in the darkness. We're called to be those virgins, like those ten virgins, standing out 
on the road, standing out in the world, shining a light for Jesus to come. You can come to church, you can say all the right prayers, but if we don't live differently in our lives, and God says he hates it, it's detestable to him. And another way to say it is that if you spend your life fighting against Jesus, then you lose when he wins. And he's going to win. Jesus is going to win. But if we've been contending for justice, fighting for the gospel of Jesus that brings peace on the earth, then when Jesus does come, we're going to feel relief and joy and excitement. We will have nothing to fear. We will not have to be afraid about Jesus coming. We can be excited and relieved. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, Therefore, after he's just described the second coming of Jesus, he says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. He sees the return of Jesus as the fundamental encouragement for Christians. Encouragement to live different kinds of lives. Some of you are grieving today. Some of you are in deep grief today. And I want to speak directly to you for a second. Hear the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4. Do not grieve as others do who have no hope. Do not grieve as others do who have no hope. There were no messiahs or satans in this past election cycle. There weren't. There was no messiah or satan on the ballot. As Christians, we have one Messiah, and it is his coming that gives us hope. That has not changed for 2,000 years, and it certainly didn't change this past week. Turn your grief into eagerness for Jesus to come back and make all things right. Take your disappointment and point it towards the one who will never disappoint us. Jesus Christ. This is the only hope that will make it worth the wait. That's the only hope that makes it worth the wait. Now, some of you are rejoicing today. Leaders make grand promises, but any human or any institution often fails to live up to its goals. We cannot put our trust in any human government, only in Jesus. And I will say again what I said to those grieving. There were no messiahs or satans in this past election. Politicians may promise to save the soul of America, but they can do nothing to save your soul. They can't do that. Put your hope in the only Lord and Savior who can truly make every broken thing right. Because otherwise, you're going to be very disappointed. Put your hope in Jesus. He is worth the wait. So that's the first thing, is to be eager. Second, be prepared. I just want to say, for both those people, they can be eager. right? You can, no matter which camp you're in this morning, you can be eager for Jesus to return. Second, be prepared. All of the ten virgins were eager for the arrival of the bridegroom, but not all of them were prepared for the arrival of the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. Five were prepared with extra oil. Five had not prepared with extra oil. They weren't prepared to wait. In the Bible, oil is often an image for the Holy Spirit. As I told the children, it's a sign of God's presence with us. If you were at the service last week, you noticed that we gave each family a candle that, whose child was baptized. Say, receive the light of Christ, right? Receive the light of Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Right? So we are sent to carry the light of Christ out into the world. And so this oil, which is a sign of the Holy Spirit, that flame, which is a sign of God's presence, um, that is who we are called to be. And some of them, the wise virgins, had stockpiled the presence of God in their life. They were filled up with God. They'd filled their flasks with oil. And if we have embraced the presence of God in our life, if we have been filled up with oil, filled up with God's presence, 
then we are never apart from Jesus. That's what Paul says about the return of Jesus. That way, we will never be apart from Jesus. Jesus was with us all the time in all the dark valleys and everything we went through, all the disappointments, all the celebrations and successes. Jesus was with us through all of it. And so when he comes again, it'll just be a continuation of that. When Jesus returns, we'll continue to have Jesus with us. You know, one of my prayers for my children, and I pray this nearly every day of their life, I pray that they would never know a day apart from the Lord's presence. They would never know a day apart from the Lord's presence. That's what I pray for them. Because if they have the Lord, they have all that they need. They have all that they need to stand in the darkness. Because if we've spent our lives with Jesus, we will spend our eternal lives with Jesus. But if we spent our lives apart from Jesus, then we will spend eternity apart from Jesus. We will have made our choice. So I exhort you, choose wisely. Choose wisely today. Be like those wise virgins. Stockpile the presence of God in your life. When we know God's presence in our lives and how he has restored us, we can actually see things clearly, right? When we have that little lamp shining, we can see in the darkness. So often I feel like Christians have this little tiny flickering light and they can't see clearly. They actually don't recognize sin and decay and immorality in the world around them. They don't even see it in their own lives. What we need to do as Christians is stockpile the presence of the Lord in our life. Be filled with his presence and it will reveal things to us. It will reveal that Jesus is the solution for our sin. It will reveal the sin and help us to repent of it because we can't be much help to the world until we deal with our own stuff. Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This is the good news for us. That's very good news. So I want to ask you a question as I close. Are we refreshing our mental screens over and over and over again, saying, Jesus, when are you going to return? When are you going to return? I want to see it. I'm eagerly desiring it. I'm yearning for you to return. As we move through the end of 2020 and turn towards the new year, I want to encourage you to shift your focus on Jesus. As you move through your days and something upsets you, something makes you fearful or anxious, something makes you despair or feel like turning against your neighbor in anger, I just want you to refresh your mental screen and say, come, Lord Jesus, come. I want to see you. I want to see your face. Come, Lord Jesus, come. You know, that's a very ancient prayer. It's in the Bible. It's from the book of Revelation. It's, it's other places, too. But it's, it's this prayer. I think it's actually in Romans, too. But come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Over the next two months, I don't know if our country will come together or be torn apart. But this I know. At the end of time, Jesus will be king. Not just in heaven, not just over the church, not just over you and me. No, Jesus will be enthroned as king over everything. There will be no election, just the elect. There will be no red and blue Christians, just Christians robed in white. And it is this vision, this hope, that will keep our candles burning until he comes. Christians, be eager for that day. Long for that day. Don't settle for any lesser hope. Put your hopes on Jesus. Would you pray with me? O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that having this hope we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. We say, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.